Good morning. It's uh, very good to be here with you, and um, I've been looking forward to this, to, to be with the Good Saints uh, here at uh, New Life Community. I was here a couple of uh, Sundays uh, prior, uh, back in uh, May or early June, I think it was, and, and um, it was my privilege then to preach two messages um, that corresponded to the church calendar. Um, and one of those messages was had to do with uh, the, the ascension of Christ Jesus and his return to heaven and what that means for us. And then also I spoke on Pentecost Sunday about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does in our lives and what he does in order to um, sanctify us and make us more like Jesus, to conform us to the image of his Son. Uh, to, um, we are now in the season of Lent. And Lent is a time of the year when we focus on the journey of Jesus during his earthly life to go to the cross and to provide a sacrifice for our sins. So uh, the title of the message this morning is, I Believe in the Forgiveness of Sins. And what we are going to do this Sunday and next Sunday And the next Sunday is have three messages from the book of Leviticus in order to better understand what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Now, when I was here back in uh, May, I mentioned that I had a uh, commentary coming out on Leviticus uh, that is now out. And um, so you can uh, get it at Amazon and better bookstores everywhere. So uh, that kind of idea. But Leviticus is a very interesting book. And it's not one that we often preach from or teach from in church. One of my friends who teaches at a seminary in St. Louis, his name is Jay Sklar. He's written a commentary on Leviticus, and he's going to be writing another one as well. In his first commentary, he tells uh, this little story. He says that sometimes he will be in a social gathering with people that he hasn't met before. And you know what happens at social gatherings. People have conversations, and inevitably the question comes along, well, what do you do for a living? And his response would be, well, I teach in a seminary. And the person will say, well, that's very interesting. What do you teach? He says, I teach Old Testament. And then the person will say, is there one book in particular that you teach the most from? And he says, Leviticus. And then my friend Jay Sklar says, the look that comes back at him when he says that is something on the order of, well, hopefully he's not hurting anybody. So that's the kind of thing you get uh, with this kind of book. However, Jay Sklar also tells this story. After getting his first uh, master's degree at a seminary here in, here in North America, he went to Great Britain to study with one of the foremost Leviticus scholars in the entire world, uh, Gordon Wenham. And so he did his dissertation on the whole area of Leviticus and sacrifice and atonement and what the atonement does and what it does with regards to our sin. And he said that every once in a while, he'd be on a, in a church service on a Sunday evening and they would be singing hymns about the death of Jesus and his sacrifice for our sins. And he could hardly help shedding tears as he sang those songs. Because during the week, he had spent so much time studying Leviticus and the sacrifices that that book talks about. And because of that time he spent, the death of Jesus Christ, his work for us, in forgiving our sins, his love for us that motivated him to do what he did just became all that more precious to him. And that's my goal this morning, to make what Jesus did for us even more precious through the book of Leviticus. So I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, 7 says this, In him that is, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. 
The forgiveness of sins could almost be said, and you could all make claims for lots of things, but I could pretty easily make a case this morning that the central point of the Christian faith is that Jesus forgives sins, that Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins. It's also important to recognize that Jesus, he did something special in order to have our sins forgiven. There is this story about a a, a, a 17th century figure, and he was asked, when you die, do you think your sins will be forgiven? Do you think you'll go to heaven? And he says, yes, I do, because that's, that's what God does. He forgives sins. That's the business he's in. Well, that was just kind of silly, right? And the point we have to recognize when it comes to the forgiveness of sins is that it's not just something that God does willy-nilly on a whim. It's something that he did at great cost, the death of his own son. So we're going to turn our attention here to the whole idea of atonement and sin and sacrifice. Now, we're not going to read the chapters that were on that first slide, Leviticus 4 through 6. I'll kind of summarize them for you as we go along. But Here is the interesting thing. We have two types of offerings that are mentioned in Leviticus 4, 5, and 6. There's one called the sin offering, and there's one called the guilt offering. And I'll mention a little bit later what the difference is between them. But what I want you to pay attention to here is the language that occurs over and over and over again in those chapters. With regards to the sin offering, in 420, the priest will make atonement. 426, the priest will make atonement. 431, the priest will make atonement. And so forth, all the way through. And then you come to what's called the guilt offering. And again, the same thing happens there. 516, the priest will make atonement. 518, the priest will make atonement. 67, the priest will make atonement. Now, there was a process involved in this, and here's the process. Suppose you fell into some sin, and you wanted to have that sin forgiven to restore your relationship with God. Well, first of all, you would bring an animal to the tabernacle, and then when you brought that animal, you would put your head, you would put your hand on the head of that animal, and when you did that, you were, in essence, identifying with that animal, or we could say that animal is identified with you, and by putting your hand on the head of the animal, you were in essence transferring yourself to that animal, including the sins you had committed. And now that animal is going to die in your place. Sometimes it's a bull, sometimes it's a a lamb, sometimes it's a goat, but you would bring that animal, and that animal would die in your place. After you put your hands on the head of that animal, then the person who brought the animal would slaughter it, would kill it, slit its throat. It wasn't, the animal didn't suffer greatly, it was just just one wound, but the animal bled out. And that blood that was shed was shed for your sins. The animal died in your place. Then the priest would do what he had to do. He would take that slain animal, cut it up into pieces, catch the blood in a basin, take that blood and throw it against the altar. And in that way, he would make atonement for sins. Now, when it says there that the priest will make atonement, the priest will make atonement, the offerer has done his part in bringing the animal putting his hands on it and slaying it, but then the priest does whatever he has to do in a very official way to bring about atonement. Now, what is atonement? We could spend a whole lot of time talking about that this morning, but in very simple terms, atonement accomplishes two things. It purifies the sinner from their sins. It cleanses them. It sanctifies them. But then atonement also means that a ransom has been made 
for the sinner's life. By rights, the sinner ought to die because they sinned. But now that lamb dies, or that, or that bull or goat or whatever it is, dies in the place of the sinner. Now, there's a song that we don't sing very much in church anymore, but maybe some of you who are older will remember it. Rock of Ages, remember that song? Well, here's the first verse. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed, and now catch this, be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Now, in those, that last line, save from wrath and make me pure, that's exactly what the sacrifice of the animal did. It purified the offerer from their sins and it provided a ransom for their sins and saved them from the wrath of God. Now, another phrase that gets repeated all the way through these offerings, both the sin offering and the guilt offering, is this. They will be forgiven. For the sin offering, 420, they will be forgiven. 426, he will be forgiven. 431, they will be forgiven. And so on and so on with the sin offering. And then also the same thing is true with the guilt offering. 516, they will be forgiven. 518, he will be forgiven. 67, they will be forgiven forgiven. So it's very interesting for sure, this whole idea that the death of the animal in your place brings about the forgiveness of your sins. You are no longer under the threat of death. You are no longer considered impure in God's sight. Because of the sacrifice that you brought, you are now forgiven. Now, there's one catch, and there's, this is not always so um, well mentioned, I guess, in sermons on this whole area, but there's one catch, and it's this. Time and time again, when it says, if a person sins, they must bring a sacrifice, the priest will make atonement, and they will be forgiven, but it also says over and over again that these are for unintentional sins. Not for intentional ones, but for unintentional ones. So there it is. With regards to the sin offering, it's specified in 4.2, 4.13, 4.22, 4.27, when a person sins unintentionally. And then the same thing for the guilt offering in 5.15 and 5.18, when a person sins unintentionally. And I'm going to focus in on that particular part. But before I do, I just want to mention one more thing before we get into looking at that. And that is, I mentioned earlier that I was going to make a uh, try to show the distinction between the sin offering and the guilt offering. So look at how the guilt offering is introduced in Leviticus 5, 14 to 15. It says there, The Lord said to Moses, When anyone is unfaithful to the Lord, by sinning unintentionally in regard to any of the Lord's holy things. Now, right away, you should be thinking, okay, that's interesting. The sacrifices for, are for unintentional sins. But what if I sin intentionally? Am I lost? Is there no sacrifice for sin? Well, we're going to deal with that. But the, the guilt offering in particular went kind of above the sin offering in that the guilt offering was for sins particularly in regard to the holy things of the Lord, in some way desecrating them, almost as it were making them unholy or regarding them as unholy. Now, in order to get a better handle on this, this whole, I think of un, uh, whole idea of unintentional, let's read some passages from Leviticus here. So Leviticus 5, it says there in verse 1, If anyone sins because they do not speak up when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they have seen or learned about, they will be held responsible. Now that's interesting because this is about the sin offering 
And if you are guilty of this, what it says in 5.1, you can bring a sin offering for your sins. But now there's a question. And the question is, if there is a public invitation for you to speak up and bring evidence in some kind of matter that ought to come before the courts, and you fail to do so, you don't do it, and you hold that information back, can that be said to be unintentional? And then Leviticus 6, with regards to the, to the guilt offering, it says this, The Lord said to Moses, If anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving a neighbor about something entrusted to them or left in their care or about something stolen, or if they cheat their neighbor, or if they find lost property and lie about it, or if they swear falsely about any such sin that people may commit, when they sin in any of these ways and realize their guilt, they must return what they have stolen or taken by extortion or what was entrusted to them or the lost property they found, or whatever it was they swore falsely. And then it goes on to say, they can bring their offering, and the priest will make atonement, and they will be forgiven. Now, when you look at this list here of things, does that sound unintentional? Here are the kinds of sins listed in these two passages. Failure, speak up, when asked to testify, uttering, a rash oath, deceiving a neighbor, cheating a neighbor, lying about lost property, swearing falsely. Those look like very intentional sins. So how does this work then? Well, there's been a lot of discussion about this in the commentaries, and I'm going to make kind of a, a long story short here, but look at this passage in Leviticus 5, 14 to 15. The Lord said to Moses, when anyone is unfaithful, and I put the Hebrew word there for you because it's important for us to see. I, don't, I try to avoid this if at all possible, but this is important here. If anyone is unfaithful, and the Hebrew word here is ma'al, to the Lord by sinning unintentionally. Now here's the problem. This is almost like an oxymoron to say, that if anyone sins unintentionally by being unfaithful, that word ma'al, representative translations for this word are terms like unfaithful, treacherous, break faith, treason, treachery, disobedience, rebellion, hostility. It is never used anywhere else in the entire Old Testament to refer to unintentional sins. So when in Leviticus 5, verses 14 and 15, it says, when anyone is unfaithful to the Lord by sinning unintentionally, that's almost like a contradictory sentence. It's almost like an oxymoron. Here's what I think is happening here. How do we account for this? I think what it indicates is that this is an act of sheer grace and mercy on the part of the Lord. In the very form of the command, there is this harsh clash between the word ma'al, unfaithfulness, or rebellion, or treachery, or treason, and the word unintentional. The Lord gives a command regarding a sacrifice for unintentional sins, but he also, in the very same verse, signals his willingness by his own sovereign grace and mercy to take intentional sins and categorize them as if they were unintentional ones. That is a huge move on his part. The sin and the guilt offering were for unintentional sins, but God signals here by using that word ma'al that he is willing to take the things that you and I have done intentionally in our sin against the Lord and commute them, as it were, to being unintentional sins. Now, 
Let me just jump ahead here to the book of Isaiah. Every year about this time, especially when it comes to Passion Week, Holy Week, Good Friday, we often read in Isaiah 53. And here's what Isaiah 53.10 says. It says, It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And then, right after that, it says, The Lord makes his life a guilt offering. Isn't that amazing? The servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53, the one whom we know will be the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, he becomes the sin offering for our sins. The servant of the Lord becomes a guilt offering for the very people who earlier in Isaiah 53 are described as those who regarded the servant as someone who was being punished by God. Indeed, they despised this servant, and they were actively involved in his punishment. Yet, by offering himself as a guilt offering, the servant of the Lord atones for the sins these people committed as if it was done in ignorance by people who had gone astray like lost sheep. Now here's the interesting thing. That theme of ignorance or unintentional continues when we come to the New Testament. So, for example, in Luke 23, when Jesus dies on the cross, he prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then later, in Acts chapter 3, the Apostle Peter, in one of his very first sermons, says this, Fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. And the question that I have to ask here is, really? Look at the list. The Jewish leaders plotted. Judas betrayed him for silver. Herod was a co-conspirator. Pilate, despite his recognition of Jesus' innocence, nevertheless condemns Jesus to death after having already punished him by scourging. The crowds accepted full responsibility, calling down judgment on their own heads if what they were doing was wrong. You know, when you look at that list, it looks pretty intentional, doesn't it? And yet, Jesus prays for them and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 1 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, he says, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And then, in Hebrews 5, we read this. Every high priest is selected among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins, He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And this is about the Old Testament priests who were sinful. But this is true even for Jesus. As on the cross, he is the sacrifice for our sins, as well as the priest who offers himself for our sins. He does so for those who are ignorant and going astray and even takes our unintentional sins and marks them up, or takes our intentional sins and chalks them up as unintentional ones. Now, there are two upshots that you and I ought to glean from what Jesus Christ has done for us. The first one is this. We should be 
extremely grateful for what Jesus Christ has done for us. He forgave us at great cost to himself. To forgive us, it cost him his life, his death, his blood. Even as Jesus said, the night of the Lord's Supper, this is my blood of the covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Never forget that our forgiveness was not just something that God said, okay, I'll forgive him. No, he did it at a tremendous sacrifice for us. But then there is one other upshot of this which lays a heavy obligation on us. Now, the next slide that you're going to forget, you, uh, that you're going to get here, uh, this next slide, you may recognize what I have done here. I've taken a line from Shakespeare and I've changed it. Shakespeare's line is to be or not to be. That is the question. Well, I'm changing it here a little bit. To forgive or not to forgive. And my huge alteration is, sorry, that is not the question. Because you see, you and I don't have the option here. We don't have the option of saying, should I forgive or not forgive? We only have the command from Jesus Christ himself to forgive. And we do that because we have been forgiven. Ephesians 4, 32, Paul says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And then Colossians 3.23 Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That is the only answer to the question. It's not forgive to forgive or not to forgive. That's the question. There's no question. It's just a command. You are to forgive. In essence, then, if I, as a Christian, have been forgiven by God in my ignorance and even my intentional waywardness, if I do not forgive, then I have not been forgiven. If I withhold forgiveness, then perhaps it is because I am not remembering that I am a Christian who has been forgiven. I remember that passage in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. And in that prayer, one of the lines is, forgive us our debts, and or some translations have it as trespasses. Forgive our debts, forgive us our trespasses, as we have forgiven our debtors. And then, after teaching that prayer, almost as if Jesus senses that the disciples are a little bit skeptical on that, he says this, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, those of us who have been raised on this whole idea that, of justification by faith through grace, not of works, but by the grace of God, we might come to this and say, well, that sounds like works. I have to forgive in order to be forgiven? Well, I don't think that's what the passage is saying, but it is saying this. If God has forgiven you, your unintentional, your intentional sins, if God has given, forgiven you your rebellion against him, and then you turn around and won't forgive others, you give pretty clear evidence that you don't appreciate the forgiveness that was extended to you. Now, one last thing that I want to mention here in this message. There's a very interesting postscript that I want to call your attention to. I want you to think about the people who were involved in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Romans, a Roman centurion, Roman soldiers, Pharisees, priests, and a large crowd were involved. 
Well, you know the interesting thing that happens in the book of Acts? When we come to the book of Acts, who becomes Christians? A Roman centurion, a Roman jailer, other Roman soldiers. Pharisees become Christians. Priests become Christians. Large crowds become Christians. And do you know why this happens? Well, first of all, it's because Jesus prayed for forgiveness. But it also happens because his followers did the same thing. In Acts 7, we learn about Stephen, who was stoned to death for his faith. And what did he do as he was dying? He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his face and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And because of that, because Stephen was like his Lord, because the disciples acted like Jesus and were willing to forgive those who were their persecutors and tormentors and captors, Roman centurions and Roman jailers and Pharisees and priests and large crowds come and believe and become Christians. Do you know what the mark of a Christian is? The mark of a Christian is that just like Jesus, they are willing to forgive those who wronged them. That is our testimony. That is our witness. So my brothers and my sisters, what a challenge is laid before us to forgive each other like Jesus forgave us. Let that be uppermost in our thinking. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we confess to you that we are sinful. We are a sinful people. And yet, in sovereign grace and love and mercy, and at tremendous cost to yourself, you forgave our sins. And not just those little things that we had no idea we were sinning. You forgave our rebellion, our treachery, our treason. How marvelous is the grace that you have poured out on us. Oh Lord, give, give us the grace and the gratefulness and the thankfulness to surrender our hearts in gratitude to you, but also to be willing like our Lord, to forgive those who have trespassed against us. We ask that through Christ our Lord. Amen. Perhaps you have heard that old poem that goes like this. To dwell above with the saints we love, that will be great glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know, now that's another story. <laughs> However, that story has to take the form of forgiveness. Bear with each other and forgive one another. And if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. May God give us the grace to do that. Amen.